coming um, to this uh, fascinating lecture, I'm sure. It is the second event of the uh, Buddhist Forum uh, series of this year. And uh, it's, uh, it's a huge pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Alon, uh, who is chair of the Department of Indian and Subcontinental uh, Studies at the University of Sydney in Australia. Uh, Mark is, um, uh, is uh, Australian, but he, he studied in, uh, in the UK. And uh, he actually did his, his BA uh, before coming, uh, coming here with uh, the very famous uh, uh, Jan Willem de Jong. Uh, before coming in the UK and uh, doing a PhD with uh, Professor Kai R. Uh, Norman uh, in Cambridge, uh, the prominent scholar of, uh, of Pali uh, philology. He did his PhD in, uh, on Pali, uh, and his PhD actually became uh, his first uh, monograph. <coughs> After defending his PhD in 95, uh, he published it as uh, um, a Steigen function, the study of dominant stylistic features of the post portions of the Pali Canonical Sutta text and their mnemonic function. It's a long title, but a very interesting book, published in Tokyo in 97. And then, uh, after actually teaching at SOAS uh, for, for a year in 95, uh, he quickly joined uh, a, a small group, a small team in Seattle, uh, just after the, the discovery of uh, the first uh, treasure trove of uh, Gandhari manuscripts that were uh, preserved, are still preserved today in the British Library. And uh, so Mark was a, a, a very close uh, collaborator of uh, Richard Solomon at Seattle. And with a few scholars, they basically uh, uh, set to, to map an entire new field in, uh, in Buddhist studies, that of uh, Gandhari uh, studies. And as a result of this uh, uh, very intense uh, engagement uh, with uh, difficult and, and, uh, and fascinating fields, uh, uh, Mark Allen uh, published Gandhari, the um, uh, a volume in the Gandhari um, in, uh, Buddhist text uh, series in 2001 uh, with a, a book called Three uh, Gandhari Kotarika Gamma Type Sutras, uh, British Library Karate Fragments 12 and 14. And as a follow-up to, to the study of the, uh, of the, the British Library uh, Karoshi collection, uh, Mark Allen uh, dedicated a lot of energy surveying another collection, the so-called senior collection. And this is, will be his uh, 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 much expected uh, forthcoming book uh, called Ancient Buddhist Codes from uh, Gandhara, the second volume, the senior Karoshi fragments uh, study and catalog of the senior collections of Karoshi manuscripts. So Mark Allen is basically a, a Pali scholar that's turned uh, a lot of attention to uh, uh, <coughs> Gandhari uh, manuscripts. <coughs> and in recent years, he has also developed a, 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 um, an interest on, uh, in uh, epigraphy and in uh, the transmission uh, here of uh, Pali canonical scriptures, and especially looking particularly at the Kutoda Pagoda uh, stele, uh, transmitting a recension of the, of the Pali canon uh, in Mandalay. And today's talk is, is, is really at the crossroad uh, of his interest in, uh, in Pali and, and Gandhari scripture. And uh, I look very much forward to hearing it personally. And it's really dealing with the sensibilization and the diction of early Buddhist texts. Thanks. Oops. So just a bit more background to um, uh, what Vincent said is that, so for my uh, honors thesis, that's a fourth year thesis in Australia under de Jong, I translated the Sanskrit Savastivadin version of the, the Mahaparinirvana Sutra that was transmitted in manuscripts from Central Asia and, and made a study of this. And you know, I w was really very interested in the, one reason I went to the ANU was to study Pali and you know, I was interested in Pali texts. You know, that opened my eyes to the fact that there's multiple versions of these texts. And when you compare them, they're different, similar but different, right? So I'll be drawing on that work quite a lot today. Um, and then I went to, um, to Cambridge to work with K.O. Norman. And that was really, that thesis was looking at some of the dominant stylistic uh, features of early canonical texts. And what I was quite interested in is when you read Pali texts or early pseudo texts, they're very peculiar, you know 
high degree of repetition, use of formulas, um, and other such things. So I wanted to understand, well, what, what are these features doing? And particularly in the context of the fact that you know, the early Buddhist tradition for many centuries was an oral tradition. So are they a reflection of the orality of the tradition? And then questions of such as, well, what models did the Buddhists have? What was their relationship to Brahmanical learning? How did they differ? How were they similar? Um, and so on. I then started working on Gandhari manuscripts, so this has introduced yet another you know, new corpus of material to, to work with. And um, say publishing those three sutras, again, you know, very much looking at, well, what is the Pali version of the stock formulas and, and descriptions and the diction of this text, the Pali compared to the Gandhari and Sanskrit, right? So what I'm going to look at today is really what these new Gandhari manuscripts tell us about um, the process of, of Sanskritization, the changes that happen in Buddhist texts. Um, so although uh, early Buddhist communities, including the early or most of the early Mahayana communities, started off using one or other of the Prakrit languages for the composition and transmission of their texts, um, at some as yet to be determined time, they started to use, or some communities started to use Sanskrit. Uncertain, uh, Vasco von Hinuba puts it at, you know, at the latest by the Chaturpa or Kushan period, that's sort of first, third century, some first, second centuries of the common era. And some Buddhist communities actually started composing their texts, particularly their Abhidharma treatises and so on, and then converting their canonical texts into Sanskrit. Right? Others continued, like the Theravadas of you know, Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, continued transmitting them in Prakrit. Now there are, you know, I won't go into the detail, but there's, you know, several possible reasons for that that are being proposed by scholars. Um, for example, the beginning of the, the Christian era, um, Sanskrit increasingly took on the role of being the language of political and intellectual discourse in India and beyond its borders, um, perhaps under the increasing influence of um, Brahmins in court affairs. You know, Johannes Bronkhorst and so on. Um, you know, another possibility is that fewer people could understand the Prakrits, um, and that you know Sanskrit was a clearer medium for that transition, or and so on. There's counter arguments against that as well. Um, you know, it's also possible that, so in that context, that the use of Sanskrit and Brahmi script, which goes hand in hand, so the, the new manuscripts I'm talking about, uh, Gandhari, Prakrit, transmitted in always in uh, Kharoshti script. There's a, a connection between that and Sanskrit with Brahmi is closely connected. We, in the new collections, we do actually get some uh, Sanskrit texts in Kharoshti script. Um, but it's an imperfect script for the transmission of Sanskrit. Um, so it's possible that um, you know, Sanskrit was regarded to be a more um, precise uh, vehicle for the transmissions of text. But again, if you read Bronkhorst, you know, a counter argument would be, well, you know, Buddhists had successfully commuted, transmitted their texts for centuries in Prakrit. What was in, you know, wrong with that? So why suddenly change? You know, his argument is, is different. But you know, it's, it could very well be the case that Buddhist authors started using Sanskrit, particularly for their Abhidharma and Shastra texts, and um, the composition of these new works, because that was the, the, you know, the vehicle mostly for that sort of discourse with Brahmins and others, and that that then influenced some communities to convert their canonical texts into Prakrit as well. Um, you know, yet another possibility that's been raised is that you know some of the early Mahayana authors. Um, uh, were composing texts in Sanskrit, you know, again for various reasons, and that, you know, these communities, again, to keep up with the Joneses and to remain competitive, started using Sanskrit. So various possibilities. I won't go into that at the moment, but whatever the reasons, um, Buddhist communities have, for the most part, freely translated their texts into whatever language they felt was most appropriate for the audience. Um, dialect or language and you know for the propagation of their religion and in the you know the same vein Buddhists have never been slow to use new technologies they're supposed to have been the first to use writing in India um, you know when that happened well the account in Sri Lanka first century BC these new manuscripts date from first century BC onwards right um, also in the, in the current period it was the Buddhists who first produced electronic versions of Buddhist texts you know the CD-ROMs and so on like right? whatever's available for the spread of the Dharma, we'll use it. Um, 
So, you know, if, if Sanskrit is the, uh, the best vehicle for that, then you'll start using it. Um, so in this paper, I'd like to discuss some of the differences encountered when versions of what are essentially the same texts um, or passage are preserved in Prakrit and Sanskrit are compared and attempt to identify those changes that are likely to have happened as a result of Sanskritization and what um, differences were, were already happening in the transmission of Prakrit texts. And this is particularly in the light of these new Gandhari manuscripts from Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, so for the most part, I'll discuss uh, the canonical Nikaya Agama suttas, discourses, and some verse texts, because that's what interests me most, and that's generally taken to be some of the earliest strata of, of Buddhist literature. Um, now, the main differences encountered when parallel versions of parallel texts, particularly canonical suttas or discourses and verses preserved in one or other of the Prakrits, that's Pali, Gandhara, etc., or in Sanskrit or Chinese or Tibetan and or Tibetan are um, compared, you know, these are some of the main differences you'll encounter. And I won't read them out, we'll go through them as time progresses. Um, and I'd like to, in the first part of this talk, use as example that Mahaparinirvana Sutra that I worked on, comparing the Pali first with the, the Sanskrit version. Um, now, as you probably all know, that the Pali version belongs to Theravada school, or more specifically, the Mahavihara of, um, um, group within Sri Lanka. Um, the, the Sanskrit version I was using was from Central Asian manuscripts edited by Walshmit, and that's Savastivadan. There's uh, also a version in the Sangha Beda Vastu, which is uh, Mula Savastivadan, whatever these different schools represented. But um, it's transmitted either as a separate, an independent sutta, sutra within the long discourse collection to Digagama Digi Nikaya, or as part of the, the Vinaya narrative about the life of the Buddha. And if you um, don't know that the sutta depicts the last months of the Buddha's life as he is um, moving from Rajgri up towards Kushinara and dies there, and you're encountering different individuals on the way, and um, then his uh, uh, death, his cremation, distribution of his relics, right? So very important text in, in Buddhist tradition, you know, very well illustrated um, and so on. And that's preserved in multiple versions. So, you know, you'll get, um, apart from the Pali, there's Gandhari fragments now, there's um, Sanskrit, various Sanskrit versions, there's uh, four Chinese translations at least, I think, Tibetan translation. So again, this reflects its, its popularity. Um, so the first thing you encounter when you compare these two texts is the Pali is two suttas and the, and the, uh, the, the Sanskrit is one sutta. Namely, there's a point at which the, the Buddha says to Ananda, I'm going, let's go to uh, Kusinara to, you know, that's where I'm going to die. And Ananda says, oh, I can't die in this little hick town. You know, it's, you know, you got, there's, there's, you know, Vaisali and all these great towns, you know, you can die and let's go there. And, and he says, you know, you shouldn't call this a hick town. This once this great king called Mahasudasana and he had 84,000 palaces and they were made with barrel. It's most elaborate sutta. Pali, that's a separate text in the Sanskrit. That's fully incorporated within it, the text. So that's the first thing. Another common uh, feature you'll find is whole episodes in one version not found in the other version and vice versa. So in this Mahapanirvana Sutta you have um, when the Buddha is about to die, the malas of the, the, the town of Kusinara come to visit him and he engages in a long discourse in interaction with him in the Sanskrit version but not in the Pali version. Um, or you'll also get different arrangement events. So in the Pali version, for example, when the Buddha is in Kusinara, the sal trees in which he is lying between, they flower out of season. He tells the monk Upavana not to stand in front of him because there's 84,000 gods wanting to see him. And he talks about the four pilgrimage places, um, how to act towards women, how to treat remains of a Buddha for persons worthy of a stupa. Ananda then laments about his death. The Buddha praises Ananda. Ananda begs um, the Buddha not to die in this hick town, as I said. And you get just a reference to the Mahasudasana in the Pali. Um, the Malas of Kushinara come to pay respect. In the Sanskrit version, Ananda laments, and we don't get much of that earlier thing. Buddha praises Ananda. Ananda begs um, uh, the Buddha not to die in this hick town. You get the whole of the Mahasudasana Sutra. The Buddha tells the monk Upavana not to stand in front of him, so that came much earlier in the other version, and so on. So these sorts of differences. Another major difference is 
different in the arrangement of information within the description of event or concept. Um, also the inclusion or omission of information and information about the same event differing. So if we say look at the last words of the Buddha in these two texts, so um, what I have is P is Pali Sanskrit, Sanskrit is S SKT, Sanskrit of course, you've got the Pali translation, Sanskrit translation. So the Pali is fairly simple. Then the Bhagavad addressed the monks. Monks, I will now address you. It is the nature of formations to disappear. Strive diligently. This was the last speech of the Tathagata, right? Mm -hmm. The Sanskrit is, but, however, this, this, is, it, it is, uh, this is, however, is to be done by the Tathagata since he has compassion for later generations. Then the Bhagavad, turning aside his upper robe from his own body, addressed the monks. Monks gaze upon the body of a Tathagata. Monks gaze closely upon the body of a Tathagata. What is the reason for this? It is because the sight of Tathagatas, Arahat, completely enlightened ones, is difficult to gain as a flower or a fig tree. Monks, please be silent. It is the nature of all formations to disappear. This was then the last speech of the Buddha, of the Tathagata. So you can see what's in bold in the Sanskrit was not in the Pali and, and vice versa. So, you know, the first thing is this, this long description of the Buddha exposing his 80-year-old body and um, completely missing the Pali. What's that for? Is it because at the time of the redaction of this Savastivadin version um, that you know, the Buddha was increasingly you know, being exposed to deification and that this community wanted to emphasize that he's just a human being and this is a, you know, a man dying or what, right? But it's quite an important bit of information, difference um, and in his speech and his acts. So um, there's also a tendency in Sanskrit to expand lists, give more detailed descriptions, and generally give more information. Um, so for example, an important feature of Buddhist texts is, particularly in the pro sutta texts, is a tendency to proliferate similar world, word elements and um, develop lists. So, you know, as we know, Buddhism is like much Indian literature, uh, full of lists, you know, Eightfold Noble Path, Four Noble Truths, you know, and so we go on. And then you also get um, a tendency, you know, the Buddha doesn't just teach, you know, doesn't just teach the monks, he teaches, instructs, arouses, encourages them, four synonymous verbs, you'll get five adjectives qualifying a noun, and so we go on. So, you know, this is a, um, a very common feature of these earliest texts. This was the topic of my doctoral research. So then also within that, that those expanded lists, say you've got a, a list of, of three semi-synonymous, synonymous verbs, is to, you always list the, the, the shortest first. Um, and then also there's sound and metrical patterns between those. So you look at this one here, which is the Pali Sotena Tapasa Majjati Mujjati Pama Dhamma Pajjati, right? So you've got a list of three verb, verbal phrase at the end, Majjati Mujjati Pama Dhamma Pajjati, right? So the syllables is Majjati three, Mujjati three, Pama Dhamma, that phrase, a Pajjati seven, right? This is the crescendo you're building up. And then between it, you've got sound similarities, ma, 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 right? And then pa, pa, and then you've got metrical similarities. So the first two verbs, Majjati, Mujjati, both long, short, short. So this builds up, uh, I think, a rhythm to the material and, and facilitates memorization and, and uh, recitation. And um, you know, there's also a question of well, what does, I didn't look at this in my doctoral thesis, but the possibility of reciting Buddhist texts like this as, as a meditative exercise. You know, it's, it induces a certain, you both have to, there's, there's other features like repetition and so on, so you, uh, or it's, but it's not totally, you know, uh, unchanging repetition, so you you have to be awake, and um, you know these patterns. Anyway, many different possibilities for that, but this is a common feature. Um, so, in these sorts of these features within these um, prose texts, 
um, when you compare the Sanskrit versions, generally they're longer, they're expanded. If you've got four synonymous verbs in Pali, you've got six or seven in, in Sanskrit, right? Um, and so on. So a good example is when the Malas come to visit the Buddha, he's about to die, Ananda introduces each of them, he, the household, the head of the household of each of the Mala groups, and in the Pali it's with his sons, wives, retinue, and friends, whereas in the Sanskrit it's with his sons, wives, mal, um, male and female slaves, servants, laborers, friends, companions, relatives, and kinsmen, right? So that's very typical. Um, Now, often what's an interesting feature is that fact is that when you compare the, the Pali and Sanskrit, say, the, the expanded Sanskrit version is um, actually found elsewhere in the Pali, right, these little phrases. So it seems that um, the redactors of the Sanskrit are often drawing on a commentarial tradition or that, that elaborate expansion tradition to improve the texts. So this one here, again, when the ascetic Subhadda, that's the last convert of the Buddha, comes to visit the Buddha, and under thinking the Buddha's about to die, prevents him from doing so and says, you know, it's the wrong time. The Buddha overhears this conversation in the Pali is, the Bhagavad heard this conversation between the Venerable Ananda and the Wanderer Subhadda. Whereas in the Sanskrit, it, it's, it's the same as all of that. However, he hears it with the divine ear purified, surpassing the human. Now that phrase, extra phrase, is found elsewhere in the Pali Canon, such as the Bhagavat um, heard the conversation between those monks with the divine ear element purified, surpassing the human, right? So it's not as if it's completely new wording. Um, So you'll also get differences in personal names. Um, so where a sutra or an event happened. Now, you know, of course, in Buddhism, you know, the Buddha um, was awakened in Bodh Gaya. He was, you know, he gave the, the first discourse, the Dhamma Chakra Bhavatana Sutta, in, um, in in the Deer Park. He died in Kusinara. That's across the board, right? But. Um, Many other other events, you f find they're depicted. At, there's disagreement about that where they actually occur. So this one here in this text, as the Buddha travels north, um, he visits these various villages on his way north, and the text is sort of rather repetitive. You know, at this place, um, the Buddha addressed the monks, and he talked about you know virtue and wisdom and so on. And uh, the Pali here, you can see, has five place names. And the Sanskrit has seven, is it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? And it's, it's expanded again. There's some agreement, some disagreement, right, in those names. You also get differences in words used, particularly synonyms and different word order. And then you get important differences in grammar and verbal tense and grammatical number. So the question is, um, <clears throat> When did this, these changes happen? To what extent are they connected with the process of the Sanskritization of the text? Um, and until recently, the early Buddhist material, or sutras particularly, that we had at our disposal were the um, Pali texts of the Theravada. We had um, some Prakrit texts, very few, such as the Prakrit Dhammapada. We had um, <clears throat> Sanskrit versions from Central Asia, Savastivadin mostly, um, Sanskrit versions from the Gilgit region, Mula Savastivadin, whatever. Um, then we had Chinese, that's, you know, 5th, 7th century. Um, then we have Chinese, first Chinese translations, 2nd century AD onwards, and then you get Tibetan translations. So that's the material. Um, so an example of an individual sutra or sutra passages preserved in other texts. Oh, so we also get examples preserved in other texts such as the Divyavadana, the Mahavastu of uh, um, uh, treatises and so on, commentaries. So what we've seen, as, as Vincent mentioned, is in the last 20 years, this you know, huge number of manuscripts appearing from Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, both in the Gandhari language transmitted in Kharoshti script and uh, Sanskrit language in Brahmi script. Um, so this is 
um, the region you're talking about is, you know, it centers on Peshwa, ancient Gandhara, um, but Greater Gandhara is a, a term I think coined by Richard Solomon or maybe earlier Fussman um, to refer to the cultural region. So we're looking at um, a region in which, you know, the art, literature, language, etc., is fairly homogenous. Um, and you know, the, just uh, some of the examples. The first appear was this: the British Library collection. We think about the first century of the Common Era, um, found in this pot. This is the manuscripts found in this pot, in photographed in the Peshwa uh, Antiquities Market. And here, these the manuscripts. They were conserved at the British Library, unrolled. This is a, a manuscript that book that Vincent mentioned that I published, um, the Three Sutras. So it's um, birch bark. The writing goes from right to left, um, being Kuroshti. Um, this is another collection. I'm working on the senior collection. This was a pot it was found on. <clears throat> this is sort of a, a typical manuscript. They're often folded to be deposited in the, the pot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> I had these carbon dated in Australia. That combined with the the features of the inscription, which have Kushan features, <clears throat> Richard and Solomon and I dated to um, about 130 to 140 of the Common Era. So this is one of the suttas on the, the left, preserved between glass, and on the right, my reconstruction of the manuscript using infrared images, which are often easier to read. <clears throat> Many manuscripts also turned up in Bamiyan. So, you know, we know the Buddhas were blown up and, um, you know, refugees were sheltering in these caves. Supposedly the story goes that a wall fell down or whatever happened, and big cachet of manuscripts appeared in Gandhari Sanskrit, right? So this is, <clears throat> such as this one, top one was published by Richard Sullivan and myself, a fragment of the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, the text I'm talking about now, um, carbon dated three to fourth century. Um, so it's palm leaf in this case. Now remember, um, Afghanistan's not palm country, so you're importing palm leaf up from southern India. Um, but there's also uh, uh, birch bark manuscripts. Um, and then the bottom one, Lotus Sutra, 6th century probably, Bamiyan Sanskrit, right? Um, now very quickly, the uh, now Gandhari was the uh, sorry, uh, some of the features of, of this language, right, Gandhari, which is, you, know, you look at Sanskrit, all the consonants are preserved clear as day, right? Sanskrit preserves most consonants. You lose some, some simplification of the phonology. Um, you look at Gandhari, this is a later stage. You know, commonly um, consonants are starting to, to weaken or disappear. So, you know, a word like o, pasaka, layman, same in, sound, in Pali, uasa o, typically in, you know, that's like Prakrit, you know. And in this, a feature of this language is that um, it, the spelling was never standardized. So the same word is spelt differently by different scribes, and even the same scribe spells in the same manuscript the same word differently, right? So dharma gets hums dharma, dhamma, dhammam, um, you know, drama, dharma, and so on, right? It's a bit of a nightmare. And then you also get preserved um, uh, different uh, phonological de developments of the same word in the same text. So, you know, that what you've got there is the attestation so far in Gandhari of that particle cha and or but. You know, so cha, the, the vowel is palatalized, chi, you know, the, in this scribe's hand, some scribes, there's no difference between cha and ja, so it's, it just alternates between cha and ja, and so you go on, right? So, and, and he, right? You look at that and you think, oh, well, it's that particle here, but actually the parallel in Pali will tell you it's cha and so you know Pali Sanskrit parallels indispensable and then collapsing of some set phrases like you know uh, idam avocha idam avocha could turn up as idam that 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 verb that um, uh, turns up as avachi avai oi a a a u right. So there we go. That's, and then also you don't mark long vowels. You don't mark geminates. That's double consonants. So what in Gandhari is bala could be Sanskrit bala, strength, or bala, child. Or what is kamma in, in Gandhari, Karashti script. Um, of course, it's not Gandhari the language because the pronunciation would be different, but the writing of it um, in Karashti script. Um, kamma could be karma, desire, or karma. 
Karman. And then also there's a collapsing of the, um, of the termination. So you can't tell the difference between nominative, accusative, and locative, say. You know, I'm fine because I deal with suitor texts and I've got Pali parallels. Someone like, you know, Colette Cox, who works on Ambidharma texts, just a nightmare, you know. Is it nominative, accusative, or whatever? So this language was used in Greater Gandhara, you can see in grey, and also on the southern Silk Road in the Shan Shan or Karina kingdom, third, second, third century. They were Tokharian people, Iranian speakers, but they're using an Indian language as a, as a um, administrative language. And then up in the northern Silk Route, and then also in, in um, Bactria. And this language was used in script as a dominant uh, language. It was the spoken language in Gandhara from about the third century BC. We have the first attestations of that in the inscriptions of Ashoka until about the third or fourth century of the Common Era. So Richard Solomon, um, in his article, uh, Gandhari Hybrid Sanskrit, New Sources for the Study of the Sanskritization of Buddhist Literature, discussed examples of what appears to be the very earliest stages of Sanskritization found among the new Buddhist manuscripts from Afghanistan and Pakistan, most notably those from Bamiyan, in which Gandhari Prakrit texts are given this thin veneer of Sanskrit spelling, inconsistently applied. Um, but we also then get an overlap with the, the date of, of the first Sanskrit manuscripts, right, as, as you'll see. So this is a good example, Bhadrakalpika Sutra from Bamiyan, carbon date in Australia to uh, 210 to 417. Uh, so this is the late phase of, of uh, Gandhari Kharoshti manuscripts. Um, if you look at this, well, you know, here we got the term, a word like um, Sanskrit shravakasya, of the disciple. Well, the spelling is shravagasya. So first of all, the normal reflex of shra is retroflex s in Gandhari. So you can see the spellings there. Here, sava asa savaga, right? It would be the standard Gandhari. It's Sanskritic spelling. Genitive singular ending sya, that's Sanskritic. However, right, inconsistent, it's prakrit ga for ka, right? So, and then you'll get a spelling like brahmano, which is standard Sanskrit spelling for this, where the normal Gandhari spelling would be brahmano, um, bamano, and so on. And this scribe, to write HM, which had never been attested in Gandhari before, at least to our knowledge, he either invented it or he, the exemplar invented it, right? So you had to start inventing new ligatures to, to transmit this Sanskritized spelling. Um, however, this, this feature is, you know, you start to get features, Sanskritic features in Pali itself, you know, such as the twa ending, the, which in Prakrit is actually double T, long A, um, gets restored in, in Pali. Similarly, this cluster tr, um, and the spelling Brahmana, same, which is Pali would be Bhamana and so on. Or you look at, say, that um, ablative uh, pronoun, uh, Sanskrit tasmat, proper Pali spelling tamha, but it's Sanskrit spelling tasma, and so on. And so it goes on. Um, when you look at a text like this, this is the Ashta Sahasrika Prajna Paramita manuscript from Bamiyan. This is the um, dated by Laura Sanders on paleography, um, second half of the third century of the Common Era. Now, this text is the earliest, generally regarded to be the earliest strata of, of Mahayana literature, and this is the earliest Indian, Indian manuscript of this text. Um, now, if you look at some of the features of it, well, you know, the, what you're looking at here is this is from this manuscript. Manuscript. This is from the standard edition, which based on more standard sans later Sanskrit manuscripts. So first of all, you know, I am Prajna Paramita. Well, Prajna Paramita is feminine, but it's using I am. Now, I am is in Prakrit is both masculine and feminine. But you know, it really should have restored I am, but it didn't. Similarly, um, you know, it has this the the, the prefix ava gets coll collapses in Prakrit to o and. It, it didn't do that, whereas in the standard Sanskrit it does. Or you get something like upeti, which should be upaiti, but it, the Prakrit spelling's retained. Or, you know, in Prakrit the, the particle api is, loses its first syllable, it's p. And it's kept um, the, the standard, it's kept those, whereas the standard Sanskrit one is api, and so on. 
Um, so this shows that um, this, this manuscript that the last one I just showed you is much more Sanskritic, but it's not perfectly so. So you can see this transitioning going on. Um, now, the most basic and obvious changes that occur um, if you want to you know, convert a text from Prakrit to Sanskrit is, uh, of course, to the adoption of Sanskrit phonology, that's the sound system, morphology, the construction of words, syntax, the ordering of words, and you know, implement Sanskrit Sunday rules, you know, when the rules of sound changes that happen between words. Um, so this is say the, this is not the Mahaparinibbana Sutra. This is the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutra, the first discourse of the Buddha, and um, you see this phrase here, uh, which in English is "and the pursuit of self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, and unbeneficial." And you know, on the level of phonology, well, you know, here this is Pali. You've got a simulation of consonants, and you know, a vowel that separates consonants here. This is the Pali, this is the Mahavastu Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, and here you have it's Sanskrit spelling, but this is Prakrit spelling. Sanskrit spelling, Sanskrit spelling, Sanskrit spelling, that's fine. But then we get to, and this is standard Sanskrit, you get to Sunday say, well, in Prakrit you can end a word in a vowel and begin a word, next word in a vowel. Sanskrit, you can't do that, right? So um, this is Sanskrit where you get a lesion, um, and in the, the the Prakrit one, uh, it tolerates, still has the Prakrit feature. So that's sort of a, a middle stage in the, the Sanskritization of this text. And then an example of morphology would be that word we looked at before where, you know, that ending twa, absolute ending, you can't do that in Sanskrit if you've got prefixes, you've got to have, you, you use wa, ya, so the standard Sanskrit would be upasam kramya, whereas Pali and Gandhari is like this. Um, now, translation to Sanskrit also involves replacing archaic, regional, or peculiar prakritic uh, words or lexical items with those more appropriate to the target audience. For example, um, this word chigala. Now, chigala is a whole. And um, it occurs in, say, Pali suttas or in Buddhist texts. There's this simile, you might know it, which is the Buddha says, this at one point there was um, this whole world was covered in one great ocean and there's a, a yoke which is a piece of wood between two um, oxen with one hole in it and it's floating on this ocean and there's a blind turtle that surfaces every hundred years what's the likelihood of his putting his head through that hole well it's not very much and and uh, that's the likelihood of you know of a Buddha appearing in the world which is used he uses to illustrate the fact that I'm here you're here you're a human being strong Right, so the Pali word is chigla. This is a non-Indo-Aryan word, right? Um, borrowed from the local um, Dravidian language, probably. Um, and Sanskrit versions replace that with chidra, another word for hole in the yoke. Well, in this Gandhari version I've worked on, the word is uh, ekatarma o yuo. Yuo is yuga, and the word. Tarma always tardman with cut suffix. Now this tardman word is, it only appears in um, in Sanskrit in the Atharva Veda, the Shrata Sutra of the Kachayana, uh, Kataka Grihi Sutra of the Black Veda and the Shatapata Brahmana, and then after all the commentaries on those texts use Chidra commentary on it, right, on Tardman, and you don't get it, right? So it looks like those who were, you know, those Buddhist texts moved up into Gandhara from the, you know, the, the, the Buddhist heartland of Magadha and whatever, where the word was either Chigal or Chidra probably, um, they replaced it with a local word. And that local word is a residue of when the Brahmins were more, you know, centered around Gandhara, right? So, but of course, that sort of Changing synonyms is very typical, and it could happen in the, in, in the Prakrits. Um, now, translating pa Prakrit verse into Sanskrit presents itself, um, it's a, it presents its own set of peculiar problems. Um, because, of course, if you take a Prakrit verse and you just cast it into Sanskrit, it's not going to be metrical, right? It's a mess. So, you know, how did they get around that? Well, you know, 
there's various levels of, of Sanskritization, but you know, the, the good Sanskrit verses, they, they change word order, they change synonyms, they add particles and, and uh, grammatical features to, to facilitate proper uh, meter. <clears throat> An example is, say, Pali Dhammapada verse number seven, there's a Prakrit version, um, there's a Gandhari Prakrit version, there's a Sanskrit or Dhanavaga version. There's actually others as well. Um, so this meter is Anushtup Sloka meter, six, usually it's four padas, feet of eight syllables each, but you know, this has six. In English it's, and I will look at it in detail, contemplating pleasant things, being uncontrolled in the senses, not knowing moderation, moderation in food, lazy, lacking energy, him indeed, Mara the evil one overpowers like the wind overpowers a great tree. So you look at the first two padas, that is, um, in the Prakrit, they're identical, right? That's P is Pali, Prakrit is the Prakrit Dhammapada, G is the Gandhari Dhammapada, Sanskrit is the Udhanavaga. So if you cast this word Anupasin, you know, from Drish, then there's no such word as Anupasin in, in, in Sanskrit. Um, so they replaced it with Anudarshinam. That's one extra syllable. So they, Viharantam, which is, you know, they dwelling, it sort of means not much. So they replaced it with instead Nityam, permanently, right? And in this, this next para you have, if you cast this, um, unrestrained among the senses, then into Sanskrit it doesn't work, right? So what they did is, well, the, the use of locative instead of uh, instrumental instead of locative, that's neither here nor there, but this, they introduced this charpi, which is and also, it means nothing, and it just separates the two words the, from the sandhi coming together, right? Um, and also you notice this, this pada has nine syllables. This hypermetric is very typical in Prakrit, tolerated. Sanskrit didn't like that, right? So it's got to be eight, eight syllables. An example here, this is bojanam here is, you know, am here is a locative ending that's come from the, the pronominal declension into the noun declension. Standard Sanskrit should be bojane, right? You do that, you lose one syllable. So what do you do? Well, you just add chapi, you know, gives you one syllable and separates the words, right? From the sandhi, from e and a. Um, and here now, this is the problem, lazy, lacking energy. Well, you know, you cast that into Sanskrit, then, you know, it just doesn't work metrically. So they kept this, um, but they changed the wording. Um, that is, it's uh, lowly or something like that among the wakeful as opposed to um, lazy, lacking energy. So that's actually a slightly more substantial change in the meaning. Um, if we go to the last two putters, then you go, well, here they're identical in the Prakrit except the Gandhari lines up with the Sanskrit in saying not that Mara overcomes him, but Raga, passion, overcomes him. Um, that's neither here nor there sort of thing, but it shows the complexity of the situation. This particle va in Pali in Prakrit is eva, two syllables, like, well, if you put that into, into Sanskrit, it's not going to work. So what they did is they, the Sanskrit uh, redactors dropped this prefix and used the prefix a, which means the same thing, and sort of, uh, that's the sort of typical um, difference that you will find. Um, another uh, common feature of the um, of these verses is that you know to stop Sunday happening they will use um, this particle here. If you put hit between a word ending in a vowel and one beginning in a vowel, the y will go to the i will go to y. It means nothing and it separates. Stop Sunday happening. So this is a very uh, common feature, um, as you have here. Now, earlier I noted that when you compare, um, no, sorry, uh, so clearly these, particularly this verse material shows that these changes are happening in the Sanskrit, in the, with the Sanskritization. The Sanskrit redactors had to modify their text to make it work metrically. Um, sometimes it's really minor, right? But other times it really does change the meaning. Um, whether it's significant doctrinally, that's something else. Um, now, 
Earlier I noted that when you compare the Pali and Sanskrit versions of prose sutras, you see that there is a tendency for the Sanskrit to clarify ob obscure words and um, or phrases and to articulate what is implicit in the Pali and generally modernize the reading. Um, so a good to text, a good example is the formula used to depict a monk visiting the Buddha. So the Pali is then a certain monk approached the Bhagavat. Having approached, he paid homage to the Bhagavat and sat down to one side. The word paid homage to the Bhagavat is abhivadetva, right? Now, it's rather obscure what that means, but the, and, the, and clearly the Sanskrit redactors felt that that was the case, so they replaced it throughout all Sanskrit literature with um, at many different schools, right? So with the phrase, um, uh, having honored Vanditva, the feet of the Bhagavat with their head. Now, to the, the early audience, when they heard Abhivadetva, they knew what that meant. You know, when you, a monk met the Buddha, he bowed down at his feet. But by the time this later period, it became obscure. So they're introducing this clarification of, of the meaning of the text. If you look at the, these two new, say, Gandhari examples, which is um, here you have the first one, which is uh, the senior collection, and you have actually like the Sanskrit, right? So it lines up, it's, it, but not quite. It's having paid homage to the feet of the Bhagavat. So there's no mention of head there. But in another version, Prakrit version of the, um, it, you do have that word, right? So that shows that this tendency to clarify, expand is happening in that, um, the Prakrit phase in, in the Gandhari. Now, sometimes we find contradictory forces at work in the Sanskrit versions alongside a tendency you know, to proliferate similar word elements, to expand the text and so on. You find a tendency in some cases to actually contract it, right? particularly in certain formulas. So this one here, which is the conversion formula. Now, very typically, you know, Buddhist text, the Buddha always you know, outperforms his opponent and the opponent at the end, if he wants to become a layman, um, will say, you know, this is this one, this formula is used. If it become, wants to become a monk, another formula will be used. But it's in Pali, it's wonderful, Venerable Gautama. This is wonderful, but Venerable Gautama. So that's clearly by an ascetic speaking, the way he dresses the Buddha. Just as Venerable Gautama, one would set upright what has been overturned or uncover what has been covered or show the path to one who is lost or bring an oil lamp into the darkness so that those with eyes might see forms. Even so has the Venerable Gautama declared the Dhamma in various ways. I go to the Venerable Gautama as a refuge into the Dhamma and to the community of monks. May the Venerable Bhagavatama, accept me as a layman who has gone to him as a refuge from today onwards until my last breath. Now, you know, Sanskrit literature, when I'm talking about Sanskrit, we're talking about, you know, quite a big body of literature, a very different schools and periods and so on. But throughout all, and there's some variation, but if you look throughout all of it, that version here is, I am successful, Lord, I'm successful, I go to the Bhagavad as a refuge and I go to the Dhamma and the community of monks. May accept me as a layman who with faith, so that's different, has gone to you as a refuge from today onwards for as long as there is life until my last breath, right? So the first thing that strikes you is that very long list of similes is missing in all Sanskrit versions. Right? And you wonder why. It's quite, you know, that's contrary to this tendency we wouldn't be noting of Sanskrit to expand. Um, now, if you look at some Gandhari versions that are turning up, well, the first is from the British Library collection, the manuscript I edited and you saw before. And here we have the long list of similes, but we have slightly different wording, which is um, the monk Gautama declared, revealed, and proclaimed the Dhamma. It's the same list of verbs. The Dhamma, dark and bright. Right, so different wording. Um, but there's another Gandhari version from a slightly later, we think later manuscript, which has um, all that list of similes has disappeared, but we do, as we do in the, Gun the first Gandhari version, and this, we do have this, as long as there is life, and at least in this one, out of faith, right? So this shows the, um, the complexity of the, the situation. Um, the different, you know, version, you know, the Pali similar to, and the Gandhari similar in some respects, but if the Gandhari paralleling the Sanskrit in other respects. Um,
So what you have here then is um, the uh, in, with respond the with the first version, as I said, it has the the Pali and the Gandha, one Gandhari version has this long list of similes. But the Gandhari is similar to the Sanskrit in having as long as there's life and and going forth out of faith. Um, and uh, this uh, feature, however, this you know, with that is going forth with faith and as long as there is life. Right? This is sort of implicit in the action. And what you find in a late Pali text like the, this one here, which is, um, sorry, uh, here, sorry, that's the Apadana, um, which is, you know, having heard the very sweet Dhamma with faith, uh, sorry, having heard the very sweet Dhamma with faith in the teaching of the Jinna, I went to the Sugata as a refuge and honored him for as long as there is life. Right, some question about where this text come from, maybe North India, but here's late Pali text incorporating these same um, features. Now, another interesting um, example is the uh, opening formulas of suttas, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with if you're you know, early Buddhist texts, which is, um, say the Pali is, thus have I heard, at one time the Bhagavat stayed in Savati, in the Jetavana, in the park of Ananda Pindika. There the Bhagavat addressed the monks. Monks, venerable sir, those monks addressed, assented to the Bhagavat. The Bhagavat said this. Now, in all the, the Sanskrit versions, it's this, which is, thus have I heard, at one time the Bhagavat stayed in Savati, in the Jetavana, in the park of Ananda Pindada. There the Bhagavat addressed the monks. Um, now, if you look at some... Uh, Gandhari versions that again have appeared, then what you find like this one here is that that interchange between the, which describes the interchange between the Buddha and his monks is still there, whereas the Sanskrit got rid of that long phrase, which is, you know, the Sanskrit, this whole long phrase, which is that dark one there, is missing in the Sanskrit versions, right? Um, but in the, the Gandhari version, you actually do have it, except you're missing the inter interchange of vocatives. So in the, in the, the early Pali versions, it's o, o monks, and then the monks are sent Bhagavat, right? Um, and uh, so what you're seeing then is the, the Gandhari showing signs of that abbreviation. Of, of contraction that you'll get as a, just a standard feature across the board within the Sanskrit. Um, now, what's quite interesting is that um, in Pali manuscripts, you often find the phrase, there the Bhagavad addressed the monks, monks, venerable sir, those monks are sent to the Bhagavad, the Bhagavad said this, which is what you're missing in the Sanskrit, abbreviated in Pali manuscripts with, there the Bhagavad addressed the monks, right, which is the very wording of the Sanskrit, um, which is, suggests that the shorter Sanskrit version of this standard formula may have resulted from the tendency to abbreviate this formula in the openings in manuscripts. And perhaps the conversion formula, which is, of course, the other end of a sutta, is another example of that. What you do is these, the standard opening, it's so formulaic, and, and conclusion of sutras starts to get abbreviated by scribes, and that then it just becomes standardized across the, the board within certain classes of text without memory of the more complex uh, earlier version. And I think what we're looking at is maybe in the Gandhari version with the first um, movement in that direction is happening, so that's, you know, first century BC to, you know, onwards, that, um, that uh, so the abbreviation is starting happening there, and this is the beginning of Buddhist manuscript culture. Right? So it's, it's possible that that type of feature, which seems contrary to the other trend within the Sanskrit pro to process towards Sanskritization of expansion of wording, is a result of the use of manuscripts, of manuscript culture. 
Now another feature, um, common feature of Pali Sutta texts is the repetitive use of vocatives of address in dialogues and monologues and the frequent and repetitive employment of certain indeclinables such as ko, which is Sanskrit kalu, means nothing, could mean indeed, something like that, but you can't possibly translate it. So a good example would be this one here, at the ko bhagava, then the bhagava said, did whatever, tena ko pana at that time. Um, so you look here where you have um, a translation of that would be using atta ko monks, this occurred to the Vipassi Bodhisattva, with ko, the existence of what does existence come, into be, come to be, by what is existence conditioned. Then ko, monks, through the careful attention, penetration through wisdom occurred to the Vipassi Bodhisattva, when ko, there are, is clinging, existence comes to be, existence has clinging as its condition. And you also get so these quotative particles um, commonly in Pali texts. So what I think these, these features I think functioned as, that's the vocatives and particles like ko, as markers in the text in an oral context, right? So first of all, the vocatives are telling you who is speaking, an, an, oral, uh, uh, an audience who is speaking, right? Um, if, if the text is Bhagava, you know that or Bhante, then you know that it's a monk speaking. If it's uh, Bhikkave, you know it's the Buddha speaking. Um, and Ko, I think, always occurs as the second element, or, or thereabouts, of a new sentence, right? So Ko ma marks the beginning of a new bit of information. And, and I think, again, that's, as I said, this is very much tied up with the orality of this material. Now, given that these features would have functioned as an oral in an oral context, as I, was argue, as I would argue, it's therefore interesting that the Sanskrit texts, or at least many of them, tend to omit vocatives and particles such as kalo and the quotative particle iti, suggesting that they stem from a period when these elements were no longer felt to be appropriate or necessary. Now, it turns out that this is a particular, is also a feature of these Gandhari manuscripts. So you look at this phrase here from the Sramanyapala Sutta, um, Pali, he atako, and the Pali and Sanskrit version missing it. Um, and same with vocatives. This one here, um, the vocative O monks, missing in the Gandhari and the Sanskrit. And um, the tendency to omit the quotative particle at the end here, also a very common feature of the Gandhari. So in conclusion then, several of the differences between Prakrit and Sanskrit versions of Buddhist texts outlined so far cannot be attributed to the Sanskritization process since some differences or the same differences are encountered when different Prakrit versions are compared, that is, say, the Pali and the Gandhari. This includes the omission or inclusion of episodes, differences in the ordering of events, different arrangement of information within the description of an event or concept, the use of different words to relay the same idea, differences in grammar. But other cl others clearly occurred within that process as a result of Sanskritization, in particular those with reference to verse. Um, of the features that appear most characteristic of Sanskrit versions, that is, the tendency to expand lists, to give more detailed descriptions, and generally give more information, the tendency to clarify or gloss obscure words or phrases and articulate what is, it in, what is implicit in the text, say the Pali version, a tendency for individual words to be expanded through the addition of verbal prefixes, yet also the tendency to shorten some stock passages or formulas, um, and to make certain passages is more concise and reduce repetition. And the tendency to admit particles, evocatives, such as kalo and uh, ko iti. The new Gandhari versions of sutras show that these tendencies were already underway when the texts were being transmitted in Prakrit, that is Gandhari Prakrit, at least by the first century of the Common Era, if not the first cent century BC. Um, from when the earliest of these manuscripts dates, and that's about two centuries prior to what we see when we start to see um, Buddhist manuscripts in the Banbamian region at least starting to take being converted to, to Sanskrit, as we witnessed by those Gandhari um, fragments. 
this is at least in terms of, uh, so in other words, uh, sorry, in terms of the development of the diction, the Gandhari texts tend to appear to be later than the Pali, but earlier than the Sanskrit. They sit in, they're not as complex as quite in the details and some of the features of Sanskrit, but they're certainly well on the way to that. Um, However, although these developments began in the period of the transmission of these texts in Prakrit, I'm inclined to think that the act of translating texts into Sanskrit, which in the Northwest appeared to have been started around the first century or the third century, second century of the Common Era, if not earlier, um, this conversion to Sanskrit would have given Buddhist communities yet another opportunity to improve the texts, that is, you know, to clarify what is obscure, expand the wording, embellishing the descriptions and so on. Right? So no problem here when we're assessing this material is that we don't have the full um, the witnesses to this transmission. Right? We have Pali, who knows what date, date is, probably pre Ashokan for the early sutras, Gandhari, beginning first century BC, Sanskrit, who knows quite where that fits. We don't have all of the phases from all regions witnessing, so it's, it's, uh, we're guessing in some ways, but we get a rough idea. Now. The um, differences encountered between parallel versions of early Buddhist sutra texts and verses, some of which I've discussed here, raise many important issues concerning the composition and transmission of early, particularly Agama sutras, Buddhist texts, and factors that, um, that enabled and uh, contributed to such changes occurring in these texts, whether by design or through the mechanics of transmission. And these are texts, after all, that were preserving, transmitting the word of the teacher, the Buddha, and of his disciples. Um, so, you know, some of these important questions would be, well, what is the attitude? What, what do these, these issues tell us about the attitudes Buddhist communities must have had towards the words and forms of the text they were transmitting? What allowed them to, tr to change wording, right? Um, their concept of textual authority and the notion of what constitutes Buddha Vachina, the word of the Buddha, um, and the training of the authors of the transmitters of this material and their oral and literary skills. And also how this contrasted with, say, the Brahmanical tradition, the Brahmanical tradition of learning. Now, these are all very interesting and but very big questions, and I won't go into them here. That's another paper. Uh, rather, what I'd like to do is comment on the status of Pali texts in the light of this. So in the early period of Western encounter with Buddhism, um, that is from about the mid-1870s onwards, Pali canonical texts, as you may know, came to be regarded in some quarters as the oldest and most authentic records of the Buddhist teaching, a claim which, um, of course, meant is maintained by the Theravada community itself up to the present day, um, or has been, and, yeah, has been throughout the history. Now, this was due to the fact that Pali can preserved in Theravada lands, which came to be known um, through mostly through British rule of colonial Ceylon and Burma, was the only complete canon representative of the early period preserved in Indian language. And because the Pali language itself and the context of the contents of the text were clearly very old and therefore likely to have been close to the languages used by the Buddha, this was the argument. Now, the late 20th century saw this argument, this position being mostly abandoned in most academic circles at least. Not completely, but generally. Now, although Pali canonical pseudo texts or Pali cat, you know, early texts generally are uh, an extremely important, invaluable, and indispensable source, and undoubtedly go back to a very early period, it can be claimed that they are more superior and more authentic than any of the other numerous parallel texts transmitted by the many Buddhist communities that flourished at various times throughout Asia, um, although unfortunately a small portion fragment of these argument texts has survived. Nonetheless, although this is the case, a detailed study of the diction of Pali, Gandhari, Sanskrit texts tell, shows us that the Pali texts tend to be more conservative. Right? Descriptions are briefer, lists are shorter, the wording less expanded than the Gandhari and Sanskrit, plots less complex, and so on. Right? Um, I therefore think that we can say that in certain aspects of the wording and the structure of these texts, at least Pali suttas are earlier, um, which is in keeping with the language being earlier than the other versions. 
Gandhari, Bodhisattva Sanskrit, Buddha Sanskrit. Though, of course, we cannot thereby say that the information they give, the course of events, that is, what event comes first, and so on, the words they attribute to the Buddha, and so on, are likely to be more original. Um, yes, that's the end. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, for this uh, fascinating uh, lecture. Uh, bringing, bringing in a lot of materials and also <coughs> raising some, some very important questions that are uh, at the core of quite a bit of debates in, uh, in recent decades. And sometimes, yes, we have too much redundancy to somehow uh, be uh, busy killing the fathers and bu burying the old, uh, the old yes. theories without uh, reflecting yep. too much on the, on the implication that new narratives and, uh, and the complication that these new narratives uh, entail. Um, I'm sure there will be the, the, the room is quite full, so I'm sure there will be quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of, uh, of discussions and questions. If I might just uh, yeah, take the, the privilege of, of, the, of the chair, uh, I, I well, I, I belong to uh, to uh, let's say a parampa that was uh, very, but very early contested the primacy of Pali. Uh, Levy was very vocal <coughs> about uh, uh, about uh, um, the the kind of. Uh, problematic focus of the certain German uh, English uh, uh, on to Pali. And in many respects, he was wrong. Uh, in many respects, he was also right. For example, scholars like him were, were uh, pioneers in, in, uh, in mining uh, terrain that of Chinese translations, for yes. example, that now are showing that in many instances yes. uh, we can, through Chinese, not access the diction level. Uh, but have still an idea of the com kind of complex formation of, of given of given sutras and uh, the work, for example, of uh, our friend uh, Anna yes. uh, yeah. is showing uh, a lot uh, in that respect. Uh, one one of uh, the, the the other issues um, uh, that are still so it's still um, of course we should not it's a, it's a mistake to to in my opinion to underrepresent the importance of, of, of Pali. Uh, what maybe we should cultivate our historical imagination too is that. To be aware of the amount of what is missing, and in particular in the presentation of uh, the situation of kind of textual transmission, as <coughs> there is Pali, there is Prakrit, especially Gandhari, and there is Sanskrit, uh, it's overall what we have, but there are actually various voices behind this. So, for example, the Patna Dharmapada mm. seems to point to a particular Samitya transmission yeah. that is now being mined by scholars mm. like Peter Skilling, uh, mm. Dimitrov, yes. and that's, there is quite a bit emerging mm. there, and that mm. points to a fairly early Prakrit, yes. and that, uh, that shows that in many respects we, we are lining with, uh, with Pali. Mm. And to preach with, for my own Marasangika chapel, if I may, uh, the, uh, in Bamiyan there are some, some very interesting uh, fragments of early Buddhist Agamas from the, from the 4th century, just after the shift from Karoshti to to Brahmi, that that show that the uh, the, can, the 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 let's say the church language of uh, of this particular circle uh, that was very prominent in in Bamiyan transmitted uh, a, a version of the canon that was still very much prakritic, and for example that included a lot of this. Uh, so for example, the Ko had not yet been transla uh, tran uh, translated into Kalu, uh, mm. and and still remained in uh, in many respects. So I think there are there are say, at least five voices if we if we yes. start looking at linear yeah. transmission. And even if these voices are partly, yeah, partly, uh, you know, they are ha half heard because they are just one or few texts that are, that are present. And so I wanted to ask you, so these were some general comments and I'm always long. <laughs> I wanted to ask you if you could include uh, within your, uh, maybe within the discussion also, this kind of apparent paradox that uh, we are having uh, Pali, Pali texts that in many respects look uh, in terms of the diction, in terms of what they keep of the oral transmission uh, older uh, than, than other texts that are mm -hmm. uh, available to us in uh, in yes. written form. Yeah. And, the, and the extremely long process of actual written transmission yeah. uh, of Pali texts. And since we are, you are working on early canons, uh, what do you make of this and how this might have influenced, for example, uh, if not the diction, at least the orthography uh, and, uh, and, 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 the, sorry, and the phonology of, of Pali as in the process of its transmission, uh, uh, of textual transmission and the conversion from early Brahmi scripts into more complex Brahmi scripts. Uh, like so, so what did the, the impact of the use of script and writing have on Pali? Oh, on Pali itself, yes. yes. Um, um, 
look, you know, you'd probably refer you to K.R. Norman's, um, my teacher's mm. chapter on writing and the impact, yeah. right? So um, this, I mean, even in, in, in Pali, you get many instances of, um, you know, in the, the, say, the Sanskritization, where they got it wrong, like mm. the, 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 um, the, the suffix tr, you know, the agent noun suffix, and is it a past participle or is it an agent noun? Mm. Um, transmission of Brahmi, well, you know, first, Brahmi, the, earth, the first use of Brahmi doesn't mark long vowels, mm. right? Doesn't mark geminates. So all scripts in India were created to transmit Prakrits. You know, Prakrit is used as an administrative language of Ashoka, of the Buddhist scripts, Jain groups, until first, second century of the Common Era. And then this start, shift starts to happen, and there's big debate about that, right? So that, the earlier phase of Brahmi um, to, um, to mark long vowels and geminates mm. resulted in errors, mm. right? So when, a, when you get an exemplar and you've just got one T, is it, what is it, right? How do we restore, how do we think of it in, in a word? And that's particularly in the manuscript tra transmission when you're reading as opposed to hearing and it's a living language or an understanding, right? Um, so I think there were definitely errors Starting to to be happening mm -hmm. in um, that use of writing and the imperfect use of writing, and when they were starting to then say shift to the script, which did mark long vowels and geminates, and you really had to 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 put it down, then you know they had to make a choice, mm -hmm. um, and to push that further, well. The Sanskrit authors, when they were faced with a, a Prakrit text, and you often get in Buddhist Pali texts this deliberate ambiguity in punning, you know, you couldn't do that. You've got to choose one or the other. And they chose one, and they got it right or wrong, you know. Well, actually, it, it, there's no right or wrong because there was a punning on both, yeah. right? So um, definitely, mm -hmm. yeah, problem what, what, what struck me at, as odd is that so when you look at uh, like epigraphical variants of Pali to, to borrow the yes. expression of Pony Nuba, or uh, early Pali um, quotations of Pali scriptures that we find in, for example, early inscriptions from Burma, etc. Yes. The, the, the orthography is, looks very regular in many respects. And yes. And to some extent, what the, one of the oddities that we observe in reading Gandhari manuscripts if, you, if we had only these to look at Pali, yes. uh, yeah. we would say, well, yeah. the Pali was not fixed, and yes. uh, there was no rules. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So I, I wonder how it, this might yeah. inform the, yeah. the way we yeah. reflect about it. Uh, so you, you're getting at that, well, Pali, the orthography, seemed to have been fixed at a fairly early period. Well, uh, no, that I, I wasn't thinking at, at, uh, at, 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 the, at the reverse, actually. Oh, OK. Uh, at the reverse. So there are, there are a number of features uh, yes. uh, that show that, for example, even when the length is written, uh, yes. for example, if you look at the kind of cluster of Pali looking uh, texts connected to the Teriya lineage transmitted in Nagarjuna Kanda. Yep. Even when they are used, when they start using the, uh, the, the vowel marker, yes. they, are, they are extremely irre irregular on that. Yes, uh, in that okay. Yep. Uh, so it seems that, and they, and they are attributed mm. to monks who are quite prominent figures, yes. etc. Yes. It still, still seems that in many, many respects the tradition is, flu is um, is let's say alive and uh, yes. and as uh, yep. the editor that Polish uh, yes. as, uh, yep. as we are used to yes. the text. Yep. Uh, and also that it's showing that the monks who are doing that it's completely they're fluent in the language. Mm. It's just a a prompt mm. the writing to like the Gandhari, right? You you I said that you know you, what you write is Kamma would be in Gandhari in Kharoshti script, you don't know whether that's karma or karma, mm -hmm. right? When the, but in reciting it and reading it, the monks would know exactly what it is mm -hmm. from the context. In some, you know, transmissions, maybe that there's an yeah. a, a, there's a divorcing from it. Yeah, when they but it you know, yeah. normally, you know, you could do English. I, I believe there's you know sort of experiments in that way. You just drop out all the vowels of English, mm -hmm. and you can read it. Yeah. You know, because you're a fluent English speaker. Mm -hmm. But. Well, yep. if, if you connect that to orality, then uh, it's kind of contradictory because you, on one hand, the markers, the orality markers, have dropped. Yes. Uh, but still, it's in Gandhari, it's 
Well, they're dropping, falling out. Exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah. It, it kind of contradicts that in a way. Yes. Yeah. Look, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't quite know how to answer that. So is it the case that, um, is it in the recitation of the texts? Just you know, a more general question would be, how does orality fit into these different categories? Yes. Is, for example, the Pali version, also were the Pali retaining thing yes. uh, longer also because they used yep. orality at, yep. at the site for a longer time yep. were not or yeah. were is look you know this in a Sanskrit is manuscript yep. What is Kandari? Yeah. Well, it's what we're looking at the beginning of manuscript culture it seems. And um, uh, that's uh, you know, is it is the the features that I say it's a lot lack of the core particle and so on, lack of vocatives, is that really, is that just the scribes tending to abbreviate, right? But in if you recited the text, you would recite it in full, or or is it actually they were stopping to recite with the vocatives in it. My inclination is to think that when they recite, they recite in full. So even in Pali, you take, say, the standard you know, um, manuscripts of Agama texts, you'll have um, the beginning of suttas just abbreviated, right? But if you see, if you go to the British Library and you'll have anthologies of personal monks who have collected a couple of suttas here and there and a bit of Vinaya and Abhidharma, the, the full shebang's there, right, for recitation. And, um, you know, often in, say, Pali manuscripts, you'll get the first sutta of a collection, of a subset, you know, a vaga or something, will have the full introductory nidana, and all the rest won't, right? And it'll have the full conclusion, and then all the rest won't, but the last one will have the full, you know, so this is a manuscript that, scribal thing because manuscripts are expensive, you know, time consuming to write. Um, so I think there is there's a difference between manuscript representation and uh, the actual recitation. Right? And there's also there's a problem we face in um, we don't really know what these manuscripts were for. Right, there's the Gandhari ones in this case. So um, the, the senior collection I'm working on is found in, you saw the second example of a pot. And this seemed to be, it's all by the same scribe. It um, seemed to have been produced by the donor who's mentioned on the inscription on the pot as a, as a, um, a pious act. Right for his mother and father, and so he's commissioned a collection of suttas. It's an anthology to be written in and buried. Right. So, is it the case that a sutta that is written out by a scribe for that purpose is the full version, contracted version, or you know, does it really for him? So, what is you know? And what we're also finding is, say, among these, Richard Solomon wrote an article on this, which is. Um, there's, we're, we're, many, we're finding many manuscripts which only have the beginning of a sutta and not the rest. And first we thought, oh, well, the, the, the remaining, because you a Gandhari manuscript may be this long, and then you, you write on the next manuscript and they're separate scrolls. And, you know, you just didn't, the others haven't survived. But the pattern seemed to be there that you're, what looks like is scribes were writing the beginning of text as representative of the whole. So they're ritual, ritual manuscripts. Um, so there's you know these complex things going on between written versions and and uh, and uh, recitation versions, and even within recitation, you've got a, a version of say the Mahasan, uh, the Satipatthana Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya version is so long, Digi Nikaya version is longer because they've added another bit, right? So on one occasion, the monks would have recited a longer version for the audience, and this is you know. Um, I think typical in many oral contexts where you vary the nature of the text you're reciting um, according to the audience and expectations in the occasion. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I just want to ask about Sanskritization. Yes. Um, your teacher, K. R. Norman, yeah. he has written a few times that in the Pali calendar would have happened when they wrote it down in the first century BC. It seems a bit early to me. So yep. 
because you have proc, you have the standard epigraphical proc grids, you have epigraphical hybrid Sanskrit, and then full Sanskrit in yes. epigraphy. Yep. So that seems to be a better model. I'm wondering if it is found in the Gandhari manuscripts. That's sort of gradual Sanskritization. Um, yes, it's it's gradual and uh, piecemeal. And also, you know, we're just looking from one region. So those um, texts that are showing Sanskritization are from one place, Bamiyan. Um, but we are actually finding some Kuroshti manuscripts um, that are writing Sanskrit. And they don't mark long vowels. They don't mark geminates. It's an imperfect medium for transmitting Sanskrit. But you can tell from all features that it's Sanskrit that they're getting, that they're writing. Um, there's, um, so there's one in uh, the in Ingo Strauss working on a collection from Bajau, I think the second century. There's a, um, a Rajaniti text, it's not a Buddhist text, and uh, you know, it gives account of how a king should act. And that's the features show that I think it's about second century. Um, the dating of this stuff is problematic. Um, you know, you date it on paleography, shape of letters. We do some carbon dating. Carbon dates, as you saw, the dates are big, right? Often two centuries. And then you've got to try and you know, combine these various features. In the case of the senior collection, we were lucky enough that it had an inscription on the, this pot which had, according to Richard Solomon, Kushan features. Um, and it, it referred to the year 12. And we, he argued that it's the date of the year of Kanishka. Well, as you know, the year of Kanishka is a real big problem, but adopting Harry Falk's year of the accession at 2127, that leaves you with 130 to 140. There's lots of ifs, right? But, um, you know, what these, these manuscripts are witnessing is, you know, the very, what we think are the earliest, the British, music, li British library material some of the earliest, and some of the carbon dates on some of the other collections are returning BC, first century BC dates, um, which don't show f Sanskrit features. But those that return late uh, carbon dates, second century, third century, are showing Sanskrit features. Right? Um, so that's, and then they happen to be found, or at least the Bamiyan material, at the same place where the earliest Sanskrit manuscripts like the Ashta Sahasrika, um, second century, third century, right? So, and so it looks like you're witnessing in that region at least the transition from uh, use of Sanskrit to uh, Prakrit to Sanskrit and Brahmi, Kondroshti to Brahmi. Um, Ingo Strauch's written an article not long ago on, on the why did uh, Brahmi replace Sanskrit, uh, Kuroshti, right? And it's a lot to do with Brahmins and, you know, the Brahmins, per, because Brahmi was created for Prakrit, it was imperfect for Sanskrit, but the Brahmins adopted it to faithfully transmit Sanskrit, which made it a much more powerful tool, right? So that, with, along with other um, pressures, or perhaps influences from Brahmins, um, resulted in the shift towards Sanskrit. Yeah. Bamiyan is very interesting for this, because there are some cases also of uh, palimpsest, in which you had a, a, a palimpsest that was yep. uh, Matsuda. Yes. I don't know if yep. you published it. I don't know. I don't know. So you, you had uh, Kamashi yep. leaves um, that were erased, and Brahmi was written on yep. top of them. And again, in the context in which, in the fourth century, you see the attempt by the local community to really try and put together a canon in their kind of form of Sanskritized practice, uh, adopting a particular format and a particular uh, language that is yeah, very much uh, heterogeneous in many respects. Uh, and, so, and you have earlier third century yep. in uh, And I've also seen, not long ago, a, a manuscript um, which has Kuroshti Gandhari on one side and Brahmi, Kushan Brahmi Sanskrit on the other side. Yeah. Any other question? You have still some time. Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, just while while fill the the gap, but. Um, you know, something I didn't look at much is the way in, you know, the way to which in Sanskrit versions you often get more complex narratives, right? So I showed you one example from the 
um, Samanapala Sutra, Samanyapala Sutra, which is this is um, the context is King Ajatasattu. Now you know the story of him. He had um, backed Devadatta to usurp the Buddha from the, as leader, and uh, he had killed his father Bimbisara, who was a follower of the Buddha. Right. So he, the Sutta depicts him sitting in the court on a full moon night, and he says, "Who, you know, what should I do on this full moon night, or which minister, or whatever should I, what, which monk or Brahmin should I visit?" And in the Pali version, it's the simplest. Six ministers say, you should visit this, you know, the, the six rival teachers of the Buddha's day, right? And then finally, you know, the Buddha, um, uh, Jadasattva notices that Jivaka, his physician, is sitting there silently. He says, why are you silent? And he says, well, the Buddha's sitting, you know, not far away. Let's go visit him. So the king goes off to visit him. On the way, he, you know, because Jivaka said there's 1,250 monks, he can't hear them. So he thinks Jivaka is leading to him to his ruin, and he's got fear and dread, he meets the Buddha, and then he asks him, what's the result, what's the benefits of living the ascetic life? And the Buddha gives this long discourse, which you know shows that his monks have a better time, you know, all these things. Well, I'm working on a Gandhari manuscript, this in the senior collection, which just preserves the introductory narrative. And even though it's in Gandhari Prakrit and dating to 130 to 140, it's the most complex narrative structure. And it matches the narrative structure in the Dharmaguptaka Chinese translation. And this is what I, a further argument for why this is a Dharmaguptaka collection. That is, the narrative goes, he's sitting among his courtiers, and he says, what should I do in this night? And you know, the, the women of the court say, let's go up to the roof and you know, have fun. And uh, the, the, the prince says, well, let's, you know, let's go off and bash up our neighbors with the army. And the, 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 the head of the army says, well, let's parade around the city wall with the army. And then finally, the, you get the standard the, the ministers and you know, describe the, each of the heretical teachers and then Jivaka. But in this case, each of the ministers is named and the prince, they're all named, right? And then um, on the way, the description of the, his fear and dread is more complex with the, the elephants and the, the, the women. And then he, at the suit of stops when he meets the Buddha and he says, well, which is the Buddha? And he meets the Buddha and he says, well, he sees all the monks calm and the Buddha calm. He says, I wish my son was as calm as this. Well, it turns out Udayi Bhadra kills him later. So, you know, this is, so that's an interesting feature, because here's a very early manuscript, right, which has the most complex narrative structure. Now, you know, you could just straight out say, well, this is later. You know, maybe that's too simplistic. Maybe for that telling of that text, it was appropriate for that audience to tell a more complex story. I right? don't know. But it's a, it's, a, it's a repeating feature that the Pali is simpler on all of these levels. But again, as Vincent said, you know, you know, Analeo has done a lot of work recently on comparing the, um, you know, Pali, all versions. And, you know, and it's not so straightforward. The Pali shows uh, later developments or errors in, you know, doing omissions and all sorts. So, um, that's why I think you can say, well, in terms of uh, some elements of diction and structure, and particularly narrative portions, the Pali is the most conservative. Um, yep. That's not the same as saying it preserves the earliest copy. No, and, and actually, um, I haven't done this in detail. What All of the examples I've given today, except the verses, are from the narrative portions of prose texts, right? Now, this is light on doctrine, right? Um, you know, the last words, the last action to the Buddha, that's pretty significant, right? But um, in terms of, say, the description of the four Brahma Viharas or the four exertions, pradana, pahanas in Pali, you know, pahanas in Gandhari, padanas in, in um, Sanskrit. Well, um, they're very similar, right? So it's possible, and I, I need to do much more work on that. Of, is it the case that the narrative uh, prose portions were more open to change than the, the core doctrines, right? Um, you know, just, 
you know, another aside, which is that the other project that Vincent said I'm working on, which is with a team in, from Australia, we're working in the Curador Pagoda in northern Burma. And this was in second last king of, of Burma, Mindon, 1860-68, had the whole of the Pali Canon carved on 729 marble slabs. That's the Fifth Council, and it's pre-Western influence. Um, and, you know, I showed before in one of those verses, you know, Prakrit and Pali quite tolerates hypermetric verses and, and so on. The Burmese didn't like that. So they liked the Sanskrit as they reduced it to eight. They, the Burm, you, you've done a lot of work on this, working on the, the Tripitaka project in Thailand. You know that the, the Burmese version, six council, is often, you know, it, it just improves things, gets rid of difficult readings and whatever, right? That's a really interesting feature, I think, of, um, of their, tr you know, the most conservative tradition being willing to, you know, it's not changing the word, it's just making it better. Of course, this is a better reading, right? There's errors that were in the text, I'm going to improve them. And I think that in the, you know, it'd be interesting, and I need to do more work on this, is was it that only some portions were more liable to those sorts of uh, improvements. Uh, core doctrines like the description of four noble truths, less so. Yeah. And on this noble truth, we will probably Good. conclude with uh, thanking you very much for. Yep.